Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Understanding Ventricular Pressure Volume Calibration and Experimental Design. This is Andy Henton from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. Our session is sponsored by AD Instruments and will be an in-depth exploration of conductance pressure volume loop science, including calibration theory and best practices, considerations for experimental design, and most importantly, how these choices can affect your resulting pressure volume data. We are joined by Dr. Jim Georgiakopoulos, Chief Scientific Officer at Sunshine Heart Incorporated. Jim started his PV Loop research in 1994 alongside David Cass. Over the next 10 years, together they worked on many firsts pertaining to PV Loop science, including development of the first systems and methodologies for, for obtaining PV Loops in the mouse, and were the first to publish a paper showing PV Loops collected in an animal model of this small size. They went on to study force frequency relations in the mouse assessing calcium dynamics in vivo and also study the role of nitric oxide and neural control of the circulation through the bare reflex. Following Jim went on to join CVRX which at the time was developing a device to electrically stimulate the bare reflex for the treatment of hypertension and heart failure. In this position he applied PV loops to study the effects of the device and published the first human PV loop recordings along with electrical stimulation of the bare reflex. In his current position, he is engaged in the development of a device targeted to assist the failing heart in advanced heart failure patients. Specifically, the device consists of a cuff which is wrapped around the ascending aorta, providing chronic counterpulsation. Interestingly, they believe that some of the effects of mechanically compressing the aorta may be due to aortic bearer receptor stimulation. Therefore, they are employing PV loops to separate the effects on the heart and coronary circulation from the peripheral vasculature. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody and uh, thank you for attending this, uh, this uh, webinar. Um, as Andy mentioned, there will be a question and answer period at the end. Um, perhaps share my secret recipes of uh, uh, doing some PV loops, particularly in mice over the last uh, 15 or 20 years. So the title of today's talk is Understanding Ventricular Pressure Volume Calibration uh, and Experimental Design. We're going to briefly touch on uh, introduction to pressure volume loops. Um, starting with the end in mind, meaning uh, what is your experimental design before you even start um, collecting your data and calibrating your data. And then we're going to go into um, the, uh, the particular calibrations uh, of the conductance catheter, especially stroke volume and parallel conductance or parallel volume, and wrap it up with just a brief discussion on uh, once you have calibrated values, how do you put it all together. So as most of you are aware, since you uh, are participating in this webinar, um, the ability to derive pressure volume loops uh, is probably the most powerful methodology you can, uh, you can use to define um, all intrinsic cardiovascular conditions, um, coupling of the heart to the vasculature, separation of heart versus peripheral effects. It gives you really an entire picture um, of what the cardiovascular system is doing at any particular time. Um, the other advantage also is uh, you've heard of the collection of load independent data, um, particularly um, uh, one classic measure known as the end-systolic pressure volume relationship, which you can see here is the red line connecting the upper left corners of the PV loops. Um, it's important to, um, to understand that when you're um, collecting so-called load independent data, um, the ability to vary preload and collect multiple pressure volume loops um, instantaneously is one of the real advantages of using the, uh, the conductance catheter to do this. It's really the only methodology that allows you to collect um, multiple beats uh, and see them instantaneously. The other advantage of the catheter for, uh, for those using larger animals and you have multiple segments is uh, it's actually a very powerful tool to assess, uh, to assess the synchrony from base to apex and this has been applied in many clinical studies of CRT and uh, finally um, the other, uh, the other big advantage of using the conductance catheter and pressure volume loops is uh, it really provides um, the gold standard for assessing diastolic function through what's known as the end diastolic pressure volume relationship, and that's the blue line uh, in the in the bottom portion of uh, of the BV loops. Again, con collected over multiple beats to describe that full relation. And once you really have those two lines, the end systolic pressure volume relationship. In the end diastolic pressure volume relationship, you really have defined the extremes, the lower and upper extremes of where the heart is operating for a given contractile function. 
So brief introduction, so how do we collect? Uh, pressure is relatively easy to measure with multiple systems, but volume has always been the challenge um, and has really limited the, um, the application of, uh, of, of, of obtaining pressure volume loops. The, uh, as, as previously mentioned, the, the, the conductance catheter um, has really emerged as the sole method to provide instantaneous pressure volume data. And it essentially consists of four or more electrodes that you can see there in the, uh, in the blue color. The other electrodes um, provide a current, they inject a current into the, uh, into the left ventricle and the inner pair of electrodes are used to measure the conductance or the voltage drop um, across those two electrodes. And essentially it's, it's a relatively simple principle is um, conductance or resistance of the cavity means that as you increase the blood volume the resistance goes down um, and as the heart begins to eject or you reduce blood volumes the resistance goes up. And this plots now as a very high fidelity in terms of temporal and spatial domain since you're using a current to really sample all parts of the, uh, of the ventricle. You get this time varying uh, resistance or conductance throughout the cardiac cycle. So how do we convert, how do we go from conductance or resistance to volumes? Um, again, it's a relatively um, simple calculation. Um, you can see on the left here, um, you can see a cross section of the heart. This is a multi-electrode uh, con conductance catheter. And essentially, the, um, the voltage drop, the current that is injected between the outer electrodes and the voltage drop that is collected between successive pairs of electrodes, those pairs essentially act like a cylindrical segment um, in the chamber. And if you have multiple segments, then all those cylindrical segments are added up to give you a final volume. But how we can actually do the conversion, it's really based on Ohm's law, um, as you can see here. Since the current um, that we're using in the, all, of the, all of the conductance uh, systems use a constant current source at different frequencies for some of them, but since the current is constant, then the voltage that we measure across a successive pair of electrodes is proportional to the resistance. And again, it's here based on Ohm's law. So you fix I, V is proportional to R. Now, if you look at if we blow up one of these segments, uh, again, we indicated that they're modeled as cylindrical disks, basically just stacked up inside the left ventricle. Um, the resistance for each of these cylinders um, is, again, provided by electrical theory of a conductor, and it's related to the resistivity of the material inside that cylindrical disk. It could be blood, could be saline, um, and this is proportional, multiplied by the distance between those electrodes and the cross-sectional uh, the cross-sectional area of that segment. Now the volume of this cylindrical segment is just simply L times A and if we substitute from the above equation into this we have um, the fundamental equation for converting a volume to a conductance and you can see that volume here is proportional to the resistivity of that material the, say, the distance between those electrodes squared divided by the resistance. And this hence conductance catheter because volume is proportional to one over resistance, which is essentially conductance. And this equation actually for historic purposes uh, was derived by somebody named Jan Nybor um, back in the 50s. Um, I know it's attributed to Jan Bonn in the 80s, but if you look at their initial papers, they actually reference some of the early work of, um, of Nybor back, uh, back as late as 1959. So we have a relationship between volume and conductance essentially. So why this discussion on why do we need to calibrate? And it turns out that it's really, as we, we indicate here, it's all about location, location, location. That previous equation was based on very simple assumptions of a, a completely cylindrical geometry and a uniform placement of the catheter always in the center of those cylindrical disks. Obviously, as many of you are aware, it's sometimes um, it's very, very difficult placing the, the conductance catheter, no matter what animal model you're using, in a very consistent location. And hence, this introduces variability in, in obtaining uh, a precise correlation between volume and uh, conductance. So the necessity of calibration comes from, again, the variability in the measurement and placement of the catheter itself, but also in the variability from animal to animal. Um, the most important uh, variable in, in contributing to this variability is placement of the catheter. The catheter ideally needs to be placed within the central axis of the left ventricle. 
And uh, it's much easier to do this if you're doing an apical approach, for example, but when you're coming down through the carotid and across the uh, aortic valve, it's relatively difficult to control where this catheter will be positioned. The other factor that can affect um, the translation of from volume to conductance um, or conductance to volume is the composition of the, car the myocardium. And um, we've seen particularly in, my in, in, in mice while we were working, the different strains of mice can actually produce um, different values in terms of the conducting properties of the, of the myocardium. And um, finally, cal when you apply calibration, I think what's most important to experimenters is you reduce a lot of the variability that's already present, the physiologic variability, but you can reduce the measurement variability so that we can reduce the number of animals that are needed to either show, uh, show an effect or a, or, or a lack of it. Now, in terms of calibrating the volume signal, there are essentially um, really four methods uh, that have been used, even historically. Um, one has been a relative uh, common uh, factor, and this was used as early as the 80s where they applied an in vitro calibration where they just put the conductance catheter uh, in, a, in a plastic uh, cylinder of known volumes. Um, they matched the resistivity with saline to that of blood or even used blood itself and constructed a calibration curve based on different volumes of cylinders. Uh, the other uh, technique, uh, which is known as reference methods or gold standard methods such as MRI, uh, echocardiography, and more, more recently the introduction of 3D echocardiography or contrast angiography is um, uh, particularly the last one which has been used clinically for many, many years is when you apply these techniques you actually get measurements of end diastolic volume and end systolic volume and then you calibrate your pressure volume loop based on that. So you actually have an absolute calibrated um, uh, pressure volume loop using any of these three methods. The last two methods are typically um, applied, uh, the first one to calibrate relative volumes uh, using hypertonic saline and the last one is stroke volume calibration to get the stroke volume or the width of the pressure volume loop using a flow probe or a thermal dilution technique. Typically these are used uh, together within an animal because they complement each other in the, uh, in the information that they provide. So before we go ahead and really talk about some of the nuances of the calibration techniques, I think it's important to realize, um, you know, what are you trying to get out of your study? What, what assessments are you making? Perhaps you don't need to calibrate at all, maybe just relative changes if you're studying the effect of a drug on the ESPVR, for example, or on, um, on relaxation properties of diastole. You may not need to calibrate at all and just expressing relative changes within that given study may be sufficient. Um, it's also important to realize that uh, of the two parameters that we indicated before calibration techniques of hypertonic saline and um, stroke volume calibration, virtually all parameters um, from the pressure volume analysis can be derived simply from the stroke volume uh, calibration without applying uh, the hypertonic saline for absolute volume. If you want ejection fraction, then you would need to apply the hypertonic saline in addition to the stroke volume measurement. So let's briefly now talk about how do we actually calibrate uh, the pressure volume loop. Um, so the first, if we look at uh, the panel here on the right, uh, and we look at the width of the loop, which corresponds to the stroke volume, how do we go from relative changes in conductance uh, from end diastole to end systole to now calibrate that uh, in terms of an absolute stroke volume? And again, keeping in mind here that the resistivity of the blood, we're assuming to stay relatively constant during the experiment, which is again, a, a, I think, a reasonable, uh, a reasonable assumption. So the first method that we discussed was that of blood resistivity where, or, or, or the cuvette. Uh, um, methodology, which is again the simplest uh, method uh, of all the techniques. Um, it's using a, um, uh, a series of, of wells or cuvettes of known volume with a solution filled of known resistivity, which ideally matches uh, blood resistivity. And the conductance catheter is placed in the center of each cuvette um, and subsequently you can construct now um, a conductance versus a known volume curve, 
um, for each of the volumes. You do a linear regression, and then this is now automatically applied within your software package so that um, all conductance values or relative volume units, uh, uh, depending on which software you're using, are now automatically converted to known volumes based on this calibration. It's important to keep in mind that when you're, obviously when you're using this uh, calibration technique, um, it's Im the implicit assumption is, is that the gain that you're applying here, the calibration factor, is relatively the same from animal to animal. The only slight variability would be how you place the catheter within the cuvettes. But otherwise, you're just assuming that this technique, that the calibration that you apply from these cuvettes, since they're identical, um, the telecom blocks that you're using in each experiment, the same calibration values are being applied to all studies that, uh, that, that you will be doing. Now, so we have, um, we have calibrated values potentially based on the cuvette, and we indicated that the resistivity uh, stays relatively constant, although not always. And the, uh, kind of the quickest way of doing this is if you are introducing some solution in there, uh, that you think may affect the resistivity, it's always a good idea to monitor the pressure volume loops and see if they're moving back and forth or they're getting bigger for no apparent reason. Um, this could be a sign that whatever drug you're using may actually alter the conductivity of the flood and may need to be adjusted for. But in addition to the cuvette, um, you may consider now adjusting that stroke volume or even verifying that the stroke volume that you're seeing is, um, is correct by actually measuring the stroke volume with another, um, uh, another technique. Um, a secondary measurement of stroke volume or cardiac output uh, can be applied and some of the most common um, uh, techniques are the transit time ultrasound flow probe uh, which can be placed either on the ascending or the descending aorta. The thermodilution technique which provides um, again uh, in, in injecting uh, cold saline or echocardiography, which can be applied to the uh, either to the aortic root to get Doppler waveforms, or across the heart to measure uh, end diastolic and end systolic volumes. Clearly, this could be challenging uh, when trying to do this in mice, and may even though you may get values, it may introduce a larger source of variability. So the way you do this, uh, essentially, you now have your stroke volume, whatever you're measuring, uh, like what's called here your Millar catheter in this case. And then you take your reference volume based on any of these techniques, the stroke volume uh, that's provided by that. You divide the two and you come up with essentially a correction factor. And if your stroke volume happens to be pretty accurate compared to this, uh, compared to this reference value, then this value will come, obviously come up uh, close to one. But if it's not, like in this case, for example, um, it's almost two-thirds uh, different, then you can now apply this correction factor to that stroke volume. And again, this is um, uh, when you're when you're doing this almost snapshot type measurements at steady state. Uh, you're assuming that there is a linear relationship between um, your stroke volume um, from your catheter and your stroke volume from your from your reference source. Now, another method, uh, again, which is based on a on a reference source, but um, this is the one that typically we used. Um, we did this in every mouse. Uh, when, when, when we were doing our studies. And uh, we, we used, um, instead of a steady state stroke volume as a reference, we actually left the flow probe in place. In this case, it was a transit time flow probe. And it's really the only technique that you can apply this uh, methodology to. But you, you leave the uh, transit time flow probe in place, and then you do an IVC occlusion. And you look at what's happening to the stroke volume, both from your conductance catheter, which you can see here on top, and from your flow probe, which you can see here on the bottom, and you get stroke volume uh, changes over several beats instead of just at steady state. And here, when you plot the stroke volume from the flow probe against the stroke volume from the catheter, um, you do a linear regression again if it's a, a, a reasonable linear fit, which in most cases it was in our studies. Um, and then you come up with the slope of this line, which in this case was 0.15, and this 0.15 now will be your calibration factor that you can apply to correct um, the stroke volume measurements um, from your catheter. 
Now, the, uh, there have been descriptions of nonlinear um, um, systems, like the admittance system, for example, where there could be nonlinear measurements between your stroke volume uh, from the catheter and the stroke volume from the flow probe. But using this technology, and even if it's a nonlinear system, you're using the admittance system, it doesn't hurt to put on a flow probe and actually do a preload and assess the, the range over which your signal is actually linear. It could be bilinear so that there could be a double correction. For example, at larger volumes, you know when you exceed certain volumes, you need to apply a certain calibration factor. And then over a lower volume range, there could be another calibration factor that needs to be applied. But, but they can be... Um, they can be bilinear or even linear in most instances, but at least with this technique, you realize the full range of your system. Um, and this technique will also verify that your conductance catheter is actually in the right spot to, to assess stroke volumes over large changes um, uh, in, in, in left ventricular volumes. So it's, very, it's a very, very robust technique, and it gives you immediate information on the range of your, your dynamic range of your, uh, of your system. Now again, I, I, I indicated that we used to apply this in uh, in every animal. I know it's um, uh, it, it it would be convenient and and very handy if we could just derive um, a, a correction factor from from 10, 15, 20 mice or whatever, and just average them and apply this each time. We actually tried that and found there was in many cases there was nearly a twofold uh, range in the calibration. Uh, correction values, um, and, and and essentially we we abandoned the technique of coming up with a single calibration factor, and it really goes back, I think, to you know what we discussed earlier that it's extremely difficult to place the conductance catheter uh, in the same spot uh, each time. Um, the myocardial properties, um, not only between strains of animals, but between diseased animals, uh, normal hearts, hypertrophied hearts. Heart failure hearts, which have thin walls, will will greatly uh, will greatly off alter that uh, that calibration constant. So I think it's it's um, from my perspective, I think it's really really important to try and, and obtain calibrations uh, in every uh, every animal that uh, that is done. And again. Um, the, the, the key to applying a lot of these factors is, again, you're assuming a linear fit um, in all the corrections between the stroke volume that you're measuring, whether it's a cuvette or a transit time uh, flow probe. And, uh, it, and, and you need to realize that when you're applying that calibration factor, um, if you're just taking a spot measurement, for example, that all the outputs uh, from your PV loops the most important outputs, that we, uh, outputs, as we discussed earlier, will be affected by this calibration factor. So I think it's important, if you can, to try and um, collect uh, as many calibration measurements during, uh, during each study. Now, we mentioned there was another uh, two-step part to this calibration uh, process, and the, and the second part um, is what we call the offset, or the relative position uh, of the pressure volume loop. So now, once you've once you've fixed the width of that loop um, from your stroke volume calibration, you need to position it somewhere now on the volume axis. And typically, the loop shifts left when it's corrected properly, because as we saw earlier, as we're injecting current into the left ventricle, um, some of this current leaks outside of the blood pool within the left ventricle. And, and the most important uh, factor is the left ventricular myocardium. Um, it can be it can leak even further in larger animals over to the right side, uh, the right ventricular blood uh, uh, blood pool or right ventricular muscle. And essentially, what's this contribution is what's causing the loop to be shifted uh, further to the right than it should be. And this is what when you're subtracting this extra volume, you're subtracting this anything that's outside of the blood pool within the uh, within the left ventricle. Um, and this term is called the parallel conductance or parallel volume. We indicated the most common uh, methodology um, is the hypertonic saline. Again, you can use echo uh, and try and uh, get an end diastolic volume or end systolic volume. Um, but I think even going back even 20, 30 years, this really turned out to be the preferred um, the preferred methodology. It was much less variable than uh, the other techniques. Um, and, and essentially, what, what you 
with the hypertonic saline is you inject a very small bolus of typically supersaturated saline solution, which is about 15, 20 percent. Um, and what, what we ended up doing was we had a um, we had a 30 gauge or 31 gauge needle that we would insert in the um, in the um, in the jugular vein of of, of the mouse. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be within the right ventricle. We got good values just injecting it in the jugular vein. We injected about 10 to 15 microliters, very rapidly, bolus injection, um, into the jugular vein, and then um, looked at the washing curve uh, with the pressure volume loops. And they're pictured here on the left side. And what you see is the loops will shift rightward, and they will get bigger at the same time. And what this technique essentially does is, if you look at the graph uh, on the right panel, the dotted line is the line of identity, and the other line with the uh, with the red uh, crosses there or pluses is taking the end diastolic volume and end systolic volume from each of those loops during the time that the saline is being washed in, and it progresses those loops until that line intersects the line of identity. And at that point, at the line of identity, you're essentially saying that your end diastolic volume and your end systolic volumes are equal. So theoretically, what you've done is, or mathematically, is you've rendered the blood non-conductive. So any signal you're getting uh, delineated by that intersection point must be coming from outside the left ventricular blood pool. And that volume now you can use to subtract from your pressure volume loops to center the loops now over to the left. It's also important to realize that the, uh, the gain factor that you collected from your reference measures of stroke volume or from the cuvettes also need to be applied to this uh, parallel conductance uh, correction factor. So just doing parallel conductance is not sufficient um, to, to, to get sort of absolute volumes. This is again an example of, uh, of what your pressure and volume signals look like during this uh, saline bolus washing. And um, it's important to uh, realize the key assumption um, when you're doing this technique, otherwise it invalidates the method, is that the hemodynamics need to be as stable as possible during the washing of the hypertonic saline, just like it does for any thermodilution technique. So that if you're altering, if you're injecting too much and you're increasing the stroke volume, that's not going to be a valid measurement. Um, and you can see on top there the left ventricular pressure, which is a pretty good guide. Uh, or you can use DPDT uh, to see if you're, you're actually altering the loading conditions when you're injecting your saline. These need to be, the hemodynamics need to be absolutely stable while the saline is washing in. So that essentially all you're doing is altering the blood properties, um, the, uh, the, the, the uh, resistivity properties of the blood. Now we, uh, again, uh, in keeping with this parallel conductance um, uh, calibration, uh, we, we saw from the previous uh, two slides the graph where we used the end systolic volume and the end diastolic volume. There is another method um, that was developed uh, in Dave Cass's lab, published by Ed, Ed, Ed Langford uh, in 1990, where they looked at not only the extremes of the volume curve, but they took the, um, they took the volume curve and divided that into 20 equal or, or, or X amount of isochrones from end diastole to end systole. And they regressed each of those isochrones now back, um, as you can see in the bottom corner there. And theoretically, they should all um, regress and intersect at a common point, again, being the parallel conductance. Now, the reason um, this was done was, one, to assess how robust the technique was instead of just looking at uh, two points in the cardiac cycle. Now you look at multiple points, and this verifies that you've done a, a, a good saline calibration. But it also, more importantly, assesses if the parallel conductance is changing throughout the cardiac cycle. And if it is changing, then each of those regressions will not converge to a single point. What they essentially found in their paper was, and I believe this was in, um, in canine hearts, um, was that there was very little change uh, in the parallel conductance throughout the cardiac cycle. From my experience in mice, we also saw the same thing, that there was very, very little deviation um, of the parallel conductance throughout the cardiac cycle. And whether you use the extremes of the, uh, of, of the volume or this technology, it was, or this methodology, sorry, um, the estimate was, uh, was quite robust. I know there have been other publications um, 
um, where they have shown evidence of, um, of time varying parallel conductance throughout the cardiac cycle. But again, this needs to be applied um, in your own study uh, within that given model that you're, that you're doing to validate or verify whether a single point measurement is sufficient or you may need more, uh, uh, more complex uh, methods of, of uh, measuring the parallel conductance. And, and, and finally, sort of a, a methodology that is between those two, um, you can also plot uh, the stroke volume against the total volumes that you measure and regress end diastolic and end systolic volume points. So this is a compromise between the two techniques. And ideally, again, uh, those two points, if, if the parallel conductance is not changing um, and you've done a correct uh, wash-in procedure, they should intersect uh, at a common point. And again, if you look at the the x-axis for the stroke volume, they come back to rendering the stroke volume zero, which again, uh, theoretically, renders the blood non-conductive. Non so once we have, um, again, um, fully calibrated data for stroke volume and for end diastolic volume, you now have the ability to measure the ejection fraction. So when you have both, both uh, calibration techniques applied, you have all the other parameters from that you can derive from, from the pressure volume loop, you now in addition have the ejection fraction, um, which again could be important measurement if you want to assess any remodeling changes. Um, if absolute volume is important to you, then you need to apply um, uh, both, both techniques. Um, I would like to point out at this point, um, unlike taking multiple samples or measurements of a reference measure for stroke volume, doing repeated saline calibrations uh, can be quite challenging. Um, particularly as uh, saline uh, affects calcium cycling in the heart and is a pretty profound myocardial depressant. Um, if you're looking at models where the animals are in heart failure and you've spent two months um, trying to develop this model, you may want to uh, assess uh, maybe just doing one at the most two measurements or perhaps even not more than one because you could actually kill animals. Um, uh, if, if the technique is not done right, if you've injected too much saline. So in some cases, you may not always be able to get repeated measurements of the parallel conductance. And typically, even in healthy animals, you probably can't get more than three measurements at a time that you can average. So um, as, we're, as we're close to wrapping up, just a couple of quick points. Um, you've, as people spend an enormous amount of time, and, 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 and these, uh, the calibration techniques are obviously quite challenging um, to do for each animal, but equally as important, once you have a fully calibrated pressure volume loop, um, it's important now that when, you're, when it comes time to doing your analysis, um, it's equally as important to understand some of the techniques that are applied to this analysis, because that could introduce even more variability than perhaps not calibrating your system to begin with. Or if you've gone through the trouble of calibrating your system, you've now introduced so much variability by some of the, um, some of the uh, analysis techniques that you've essentially nullified your calibrations. And just to quickly highlight an example here is if you look at, I'm sure many of you that are working with rats and mice, every time you do a preload reduction and construct the ESPVR, you can see it's very curvilinear. And um, as you're applying fits to this, if you're trying to apply a linear regression to a nonlinear ESPVR, depending on which loops you've actually picked, you can get very, very different slope values. You can get different, you can see from the linear uh, relationships here, different values for your V0. This will uh, affect your coupling ratios, as you can see here with the EA values. So it's important. To, to realize that, to understand the analysis techniques that you're applying, if you're applying a linear fit, you need to adjust the, your data that you've collected, the range you've collected, so that it is essentially a linear data. That you cannot use nonlinear points and apply a linear regression to that because it becomes extremely variable which points are really driving that, that fit. Um, any, and, and, and similar, for example, if you're assessing tau values, a time constant of relaxation, which is a mono-exponential fit, if you look at your raw data points collected from, from the aortic valve closure to some value above end diastolic pressure, that curve needs to be mono-exponential. Otherwise, it would, you introduce enormous amounts of variation. And there's a really great paper uh, 
by Burkhoff, Mirsky, and Suga, um, going over some of the uh, analysis techniques. Um, and so uh, it's important that when you go through the trouble of calibrating, that you apply the appropriate techniques so that you reduce your variability as much as possible. And uh, the second point here um, comes from experience from several, several times that, you know, once you pull out the conductance catheter, it never hurts to just put it back in saline and see what the pressure sensor is doing, that it should be close to zero again uh, during your study. Otherwise, um, if your pressure is drifting during the experiment, this could be caused by uh, the sensor could begin to fail. And, you know, in most cases, they don't just fail immediately, but they, they fail and become very unreliable from study to study um, before they completely die out. It's always useful to just put the catheter back in and just verify that your, uh, that your pressure is... Uh, is, re is close to atmosphere like it was before you placed it in the animal. So to summarize, um, you know, being able to collect uh, pressure volume loops uh, and why I think people are still using them is, is really there is no more technique, no more powerful technique that you can use to apply and understand exactly what has happened um, to your model or to any intervention that you've given. Um, separating preload, afterload um, effects deriving diastolic, systolic properties, and coupling of the heart to the arterial system. But again, um, you may not need all of these values, and it's important beforehand to identify uh, from your study design what exactly you want to get out of your pressure volume study. Um, and then again, once you apply your calibrations, um, how will your analysis techniques now influence the data that you're going to get from this? So it's important that Again, you choose your calibration procedure accordingly. Um, you try whatever that is. You try to be consistent from animal to animal. Um, you may not need to um, verify in every animal, but sometimes make spot measurements within an animal to make sure that your values seem reasonable. And um, I think in the end, for me at least, uh, what, from my experience, is uh, a proper calibration should be your default procedure. And, um, Ideally, should be done for each experiment. So, without further ado, let's um, let's move on to our Q and A session. So, I think we're going to kick things off here. Um, talk or, uh, we've got some questions that have come in about uh, the stroke volume correction factor. So, I'd like to start there, Jim. Um, sure. Can you further explain the difference between the alpha stroke volume correction and the flow probe stroke volume correction? So, this is going back to those slides. I think where you're talking about a snapshot versus um, you know a transient. Uh, stroke volume or, or time varying stroke volume calibration. Specifically, how are these different and how, how importantly, how should a researcher choose one over the other? So just maybe your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, sort of the alpha or the stroke volume, they're essentially doing the same thing. Um, if you're, if you're going to derive your alpha from a cuvette, again, um, the cuvette will give you the same value um, each time, uh, the only variability being the resistivity of the solution and the placement of the catheter. The, uh, the stroke volume has two aspects to it. One is that steady state, um, using whatever reference measure, measure you need, and one is doing a, during a, a, a preload uh, occlusion. Theoretically, those values, uh, steady state and during the preload occlusion, uh, should be the same. Um, the conductance signal is inherently nonlinear, but if you're, there is a linear range, so if you're within that range, then you're fine by applying the steady state. If you're outside that range, which you will now see by your um, your IBC occlusion, um, then you may want to uh, um, apply sort of a different uh, a different correction factor based on that based on that regression that you've done over uh, over beat by beat. But that's really the key difference: is you're able to identify. Uh, during the IBC occlusion, the range where your conductance catheter is linear, and you can apply a spot measurement. Perfect. Okay. Very good. Um, and kind of continuing on the um, uh, topic of calibration, uh, what is your standard approach to choosing how to calibrate? So what do you do most often, why, and when have you chosen something different? Um, as I indicated, when... Uh, um, when, when we do these studies, um, if, if we're going to calibrate, uh, then we do both parallel conductance and stroke volume calibrations for every animal. Um, in cases, there have been cases where um, 
as I indicated, relative changes were sufficient, like in some of the devices that we're testing where we can turn the device on and off. Um, we just, we, 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 um, we bypassed any calibrations and just used the relative changes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So typically, uh, we either calibrate fully or we just express it as relative changes. Okay, so kind of working at the extremes is in your experience to tend to do. Okay, great. Um, folks, I'm also going to bring um, Brandon Boucher online to our Q&A. He is uh, head of a research business unit at 80 Instruments. Hi, Brandon. Do we have you with us? You do. Excellent. Thanks for being with us. Um, uh, this question I, I think you'd like to chime in on. So uh, specifically, Sarah Rolden has asked, um, in a multi-segment catheter with 10 electrodes in which uh, you know, she needs to block some of the electrodes since they don't all fit inside the ventricle. Should she block mm -hmm. the first electrodes in the catheter or the last electrodes of the catheter or, you know, both or, or what's the prescribed um, kind of uh, uh, best practice here for when you're dealing with a multi-segment catheter? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, essentially, the way you want to go about this is, is to look at first the way the catheter approaches the ventricle. Um, so typically, with a multi-segment catheter, you're going to be going in through the aorta. Um, and what that means is the most distal electrodes will be at the base of the ventricle. The ones proximal to you will be um, presumably outside the ventricle in this case. Mm -hmm. um, so what you want to do is if some of those are outside the ventricle, um, you'll turn those electrodes off. Um, moving the excitation electrodes closer to the ventricular space and ensuring the ones that are actually inside the ventricle doing the sensing. So the answer to the question essentially is um, the electrodes that are outside the ventricle are the ones that are turned off and, and the excitation moved closer to the space. Perfect. If I can, uh, if I can just add something to that, this mm -hmm. is uh, we, we've actually run into the same issue. And one of the advantages um, you can also plot, um, you can look at each of the segments, uh, the individual segments. Um, you you want to keep as many segments as, as you can active because you're trying to sample from, from the entire volume. But if you look at the segment that's outside the ventricle, its volume will be going in the opposite direction of the ones inside the ventricle. So when the, ones, when the ventricle is ejecting, you'll see all the segments inside the volume decreasing. The segment outside, its volume will be going up, and then you can, realize, you can identify which one to turn off. That's a good tip. That's very good. And actually, I was going to say another question that has come in from Thomas Sharp. It's on the same note. So he's working in a pig ischemia reperfusion model, and the heart dilates over time. So he says, when using a catheter that has multiple conductance segments, should I use the same number of segments as I use in baseline, or and I assume here he's suggesting with healthy uh, animals, or include new and or include new segments which may not have been included in the initial measurement. So as the disease progresses and uh, you know, the ventricle enlarges or maybe the converse in a different model would be it gets smaller. Um, how should one adjust, I guess, their strategy as to what, what they're recording, you know, with the segments? Um, again, I would try to use as many segments as you can and be consistent using those segments over time. Mm -hmm. I think also the, the advantage of the conductance catheter, particularly in ischemic models where there's a portion of the wall that may be affected, it may be insightful to look at regional um, segmental uh, volumes as well and plot pressure volume loops using that segment alone and track that over time, a consistent segment. I think that's also very, uh, very informative. Yes. And actually, uh, an extension of this, I'm curious. So uh, is it also correct that, um, I mean, each segment is set up as, or at least can be set up as an independent, independent trace in your data acquisition software? So is it fair to say, if segment one, for instance, was, um, if it proved to be uh, maybe a bit noisy uh, or um, just you didn't want to include it in your final volume calibration, that's something post hoc someone could decide. So is it fair to say record also as many and then look at the uh, active segments you'd like to use for analysis post hoc so that you don't turn something off and not have anything recorded from it, I guess is what I'm saying? Um, from my experience, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and not only turn something off, but you can also record the set all four se or all segments, and you may see information in there that you wouldn't see by just adding the segments uh, to get a composite signal. Right, right. And so, and Brandon, so, um, obviously Power Lab, 
um, can be set up in that fashion that I described, right? Where you have your, all your independent signals, you have a total, but you can also effectively post hoc adjust what the total um, volume represents, what segments basically make it up. You certainly can, um, and some some additional information to this is um, yeah, you can certainly report all from all the segments and gather that information, even if you make a decision ahead of time about how many segments um, you're going to be using, you can. Mm -hmm. um, but the, what you should also consider is that um, each of those um, will affect the way your calibration works in multi-segment catheter. So right. um, if you're going to plan in advance to have, you know, a certain number um, being used during one portion of the study, and perhaps you have to expand that. Um, keep in mind that each of those have a volume associated with them. So mm -hmm. um, you you want to make sure you retain that information so you can't apply it later. Okay, great. Um, let's switch gears to talking about um, the saline injection. So um, Jim, you did mention you know there is some potential risk or effect of doing too many injections. Um, Sarah has asked, should a saline injection be done at the beginning of an experiment or at the end? Um, and then also, how might this change if someone is making measurements from the LV versus the right ventricle? I mean, is the technique the same or, or may, I guess, is the strategy that you presented, does it change slightly if someone's doing RV PV loops? Uh, it it should it should be uh, it should be identical. It's a little more challenging uh, on the right side because of the shape of uh, mm -hmm. the shape of the loops. Um, but the, the the theoretical concept uh, is the same. Um, in in terms of at the beginning or the end, I typically um, I typically try to do one as close to as possible as when I was making my critical measurements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That typically was more closer to the end of the study. Right. Um, I think in general it would be at the end of the study. Is that correct, Brandon? Generally, yes. Yeah. Um, it would be. Um, there are only a couple of circumstances where I've seen people do it at the beginning out of necessity. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, but that's really, again, sort of the theme of, of this and thinking ahead of time about you know how things are affected by your approach and, and what you're actually doing your study. And, and if you need to change that, you can. But typically, yes, we do it at the end. Okay, perfect. Um, how about uh, your experience with the addition of heparin to a blood solution when you're doing a QVAC calibration? Is this a suggested best practice? Uh, and if people are using heparin, uh, you know, would it, should they expect that this changes their, uh, their calibration, so to speak? Does that have any effect on blood resistivity and the resulting QVAC cal uh, that, sure. that comes out? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if Jim has any thoughts on this too, but essentially, um, the answer is yes. Um, we do recommend that you use heparin when um, you do the QVAC calibration, um, and that's just to prevent clotting. And what we essentially recommend is that you minimize the amount you use. Um, typically, what we'll say, what we'll coach people through is to you know coat the syringe you're going to be capturing the blood with, um, mm -hmm. and so you have a very small volume of heparin being added to the to the blood pool. Um, and find out how that works for you, because um, the uh, piece of this is, you know, to try and do this quickly so that the blood doesn't lose any temperature um, and doesn't have the clotting associated. So you're trying to, you know, stem the time um, that it takes by adding a little bit of heparin, and at those small volumes, we haven't seen that effect. But yet, yeah, do keep in mind that heparin at larger volumes will affect the resistivity of the blood. So um, to mitigate that, we recommend using a minimal amount and make sure you do it quickly so you have a balance in both situations there. Very good. Yeah, Jim? I, I agree. And um, I, if you're using a reference um, standard, if you're measuring flow anyways, then this will not, it will, it, the, um, the heparin won't, won't affect that, that alpha calibration once you set your short volume from the, from the flow part. Okay. Very good. Um, all right, question from Mark Kearns. He's, um, he states that, so he often obtains very clean looking hypertonic saline calibration. So good for you, Mark. Um, uh, so much like the ones presented, however, he finds a big challenge in selecting specific waveforms for the parallel, um, uh, parallel volume adjustment. So basically working within software. Um, the variability depending on which waveforms you select, so this is his experience, can, can be quite large. So, uh, Jim, how do you approach looking at a, uh, a saline wash and, and making those selections 
uh, so it's consistent and in your in your eyes accurate uh, from animal to animal. Um, you should only select loops where you you can identify where the saline is beginning, and then um, again, you don't need that many. You may not want to include. Let's say you've got ten loops, you may just need you know the first five or six mm -hmm. um, of, of the saline wash period. Um, but the, it's important to exclude sort of the steady state loops and just just start where you see the first the first deflection mm -hmm. um, in that waveform. And you can do again. You can look at if you want to verify. You can you can look at multiple. Um, those couple techniques that we discussed uh, in assessing which which data range to pick so that you know they all converge down to one one consistent val uh, value. Right, and that um, that paper is referenced. Um, so folks, afterwards, uh, you know, when you're looking for this content on InsightScientific.com, um, you'll have a link within the slide deck to get to that paper that uh, um, Jim noted in the middle of the presentation. Very good. Um, Okay, just give me a moment here. We've had lots of activity in the Q&A, um, kind of in the submission panel here, and I'm going to just sort through some of them. Um, okay, let's talk about uh, if someone is looking for, if their goal is to determine small differences between mice in cardiac function, and they want to look, they, they like stroke volume is an important measure for them, what would you recommend as far as a calibration approach? Which is going to be best serving to them when they're looking at small differences in mice? And again, um, stroke volume is a key parameter that they want to report. Sure, sure. I would say for me, why I would consider the gold standard is a transit time flow probe. Okay. So um, transit time flow probe, thus giving you the ability to, to look into some of the time varying calibrations that you also talked about, Jim? and applying like a full absolute volume calibration for their PV data? Uh, the, the transit time will give you a stroke volume. You may not need the actual, if you want the absolute volumes of, of the ventricle, you would need a hypertonic saline. But the transit time alone mm -hmm. will give you the cardiac output and, and, and the absolute stroke volumes. Mm -hmm. I think in this case, they, they certainly want the PV loops to um, as an independent. So. Um, transit time stroke volume and then use that uh, throughout the procedure but also use it as a calibration reference um, Correct. for your PV loops and do the full um, absolute volume calibration as you discuss it. Okay, very right. good. Um, John Kingma has asked, do results, uh, pressure volume loop results uh, differ um, when the approach changes? So. Um, Two most common approaches, I think, for, and we'll just use the mouse uh, in this situation, is they're talking about an open chest approach, uh, apical stab, or going retrograde through the aortic valve. So in your experience, Jim, or does the approach kind of change the way you maybe look at doing analysis, and do you see any just common uh, differences between the way that the data is recorded? Uh, that's that's an excellent question, and we, we struggle with this a lot. Most of the work that we published uh, was with and and it was open chest in the sense that we did a limited thoracotomy. We don't have to open the full uh, full sternum mm -hmm. to get the catheter, and so a limited thoracotomy near the apex. Um, we found that was the preferred method because we could control where we could place the conductance catheter versus placing it down the carotid and going across the valve, and then we were quite limited where the catheter sat. And um, you know, part of this is not only the calibrations, but you know, for some of the disease models, it's important to get a relatively nice looking PV loop that you can actually calibrate and then subsequently use that for analysis. If the loop is sort of twisted on itself or if it's sheared to one direction, you know, where, where's your systolic volume if it's sort of tilting sideways? Is it at the top left or is it at the bottom, the bottom left? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So trying to get a loop that's as box shape uh, as you can so you can apply your calibrations in your analysis. Um, I think is important, and so we we preferentially use the apical approach with a minimal uh, a minimal thoracotomy between the ribs. Okay. Very good. Um, all right. Um, another question. Moving on to load independent measurements, uh, Jim. In your experience, what are your kind of best practices uh, and tips for fitting uh, end systolic pressure volume relationship. On the last slide, you talked about how there can be extreme variability and people should also consider whether they're going to be doing linear or curvilinear fits. 
so I, again, is there are there you know kind of rules of thumb that that you prescribe to um, to ensure that the measurement uh, is again accurate in your eyes and also consistent from animal to animal? Um, we we um, uh, again a very good question. We we took two approaches to this. Um, we defined if we were going to do just a linear linear fit, we defined a linear portion. Let's say we between 80 and 100 or 110, and applied that range to all the animals. Um, it can be challenging in heart failure uh, mice where you don't that range may not apply, but in some in most cases you typically can get. Um, a reasonable range that you can use across all animals and then fit your relationship to that. Mm -hmm. uh, the other, um, if you want to use the more curvilinear logarithmic approach, um, I think that paper I mentioned by Burkhoff, Mirsky, and Suga described their techniques that are published where you can actually fit parabolic or logarithmic fits, mm -hmm. and then you wouldn't, you wouldn't so much extract one number, but you would use that entire regression and use that entire relationship now to compare from animal to animal. And that's, that's fairly robust. Um, and it also, you can also transform your data. You can do a linear transformation, almost like a stress-strain analysis, and mm -hmm. linearize, linearize now offline the logarithmic curve and apply, and those relations are very linear. And you can apply fits to that linear regression. Okay. Very good. Uh, that's a great answer. Um, I mean, this is something that I think is going to come up, and and there's not really a solid, um, uh, you know, black and white answer to how to fit curves in in, in a lot of PV science. Um, it's it's not a one stop shop type of thing. So, uh, but th that feedback is excellent, and I think it's very helpful. Um, and, and and I think um, you know, for it's it's. At, at that point, when it comes to curve fitting, I mean, it, it's not physiology anymore. It becomes mathematics and, st and, and statistics. So, you know, make your statistician or mathematician or engineer your best buddy and, uh, you know, yes. help you figure out some, some of these fits. Um, you know, ne never hurts. Yeah, I was going to actually say that's, that's a good piece of advice. Um, I have heard many say, uh, you know, even if, going following all the best practices at the bench top and all the best practices at the when working on the data analysis software and they've they've kept to a, a gospel so to speak and they're very confident and now it's what do I do with these numbers and how do I proper, right. properly evaluate them statistically and that often goes uh, that opens up a whole other um, you know bucket of worms it's a, so it's, it's a whole it's a whole webinar yeah exactly so yeah seek out experts um, uh, and that's going to help you um, present your data properly for publication, right? So, um, really good uh, piece of advice. Um, final question here: uh, We've we've had a couple people ask about studying multiple species. There was also this note about multi-segment catheters. Um, Brandon, can you just clarify for the audience how um, is the 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 molar and AD instrument solution kind of presented so that you can cover? Uh, a range of animals, you know, either even as small as mouse, but going into medium size and large animals. If someone's trying to set up their lab or make sure that they cover all ends of spectrum, what do you guys offer for them? Yeah, um, we have solutions for, for all of the, um, you know, commonly used and, and not commonly used animal models. So um, we start off with a solution that's really based around uh, the rodent sized animal um, that provides simply the single segment um, that you saw in some of the earlier slides, um, the capability to do that, so a single excitation pair and a single measurement pair. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a single segment um, solution. Come in, you can buy the catheters that work with those rodents that are appropriately sized for the animals you're using. Um, and with the same hardware, um, with some added capability um, provided with that hardware, um, you can also get the multi-segment catheters that work with uh, the slightly larger animals in sort of the rabbit sized area. Okay. Um, then, but you're using the same hardware, just a slightly different software capability to, to expand the capabilities there. And then um, again, um, same um, recording hardware uh, and a different catheter with multi segments um, that is larger for the larger animal models. Okay. So really working with similar hardware, uh, different catheter options. Um, and, and expanded capability for those uh, multi-segment catheters. Okay, perfect. So just to clarify, effectively one system has the ability to cover all animal ranges uh, between single segment operation and multi-segment, and if someone invested in one or the other, they could um, upgrade, so to speak. Hardware. 
Yeah, it certainly does. And, and you could certainly purchase one system and, and different catheters that'll that'll approach your different animal species. Mm -hmm. So you can have you know one system on the bench top um, with you know the the actual catheters here interchanging for for, for different animal models. Um, keeping in mind that you know on the back end with with our lab chart software. Um, and, and what we provide there um, also has the capability to cover the full range in PB loops, but also, you know, um, really any other work that you, that you might be doing in, in, in your lab as well.